Welcome back, everybody. In this video, we're going to be continuing our discussion of this new branch of psychology that we introduced ourselves to in the last one called developmental psychology. If you remember back to it, we spent a lot of time in the previous one talking a lot about John Piaget and some of his groundbreaking ideas that really set the stage for not only research in how our minds and cognitions evolved, but how other things changed as we progressed from infancy into adulthood. Well, that really did get a conversation started that became the framework for developmental psychology. But today's developmental psychologist actually looks really different from some of the early ones around at the 1920s and 30s. So what we're going to do today is really take a look at not only some of the things that developmental psychologists could potentially explore, but some of the mindsets that developmental psychologists hold with them when they're trying to study humans in their particular branch of psychology. To explore this specific topic, I typically like to start with a conversation activity. Now, obviously, in an online class, it's a little bit tougher to do this, but I, I do want to allude to it because I think this could pick a number of ideas in many of your heads and, well, potentially help us even if we don't have the discussion aspect of it in these online forms. So what I would do if we were in an in-person class is ask all of you to pair up with another person and think back to when you were a young child. Think back to the personality that that person had, the physical skills that that individual had. Think about some of the maybe social skills or even some of the, the more pronounced cognitive differences that you might find. And what I would like people to do when they were doing this is kind of talk about what stayed the same, what's changed, and if there's a lot of similarity between the two people that were paired up. And this usually leads to a pretty darn lengthy conversation. For some reason, students typically find it kind of fun to think about who they were when they were younger and what they were like and what's changed and what stayed the same. And even though this sort of seems just like a fun journey to the past, there is actually a point behind it. What's the point behind this activity? Well, when we get to the end, we start to recognize that Many of us throughout our childhood, and adolescence, and into early adulthood have constantly been under the process of change. The change might change from thing to thing as we're developing either physically or mentally or emotionally, but we're almost always changing in some way. What developmental psychologists today do is try to understand that change. Try to understand not only how we're shifting, but maybe the source of it. But to do this, to study change from the moment of conception, when we're a first cell called a zygote, all the way to death, and in some cases, if looking at family members, beyond death, well, then we have to understand some basic assumptions that all developmental psychologists carry with them. And it's that when we study this change, we have to be scientific, and we do have to operate in a world that's not focused on absolutes. Because this change that we all undergo is maybe common in certain places, but sort of unique for individuals. And this brings me to one of my favorite analogies I ever heard when trying to understand this branch of psychology called developmental psychology. It was an analogy that equated everybody to snowflakes. I promise there's no political information tied to this analogy. Because in this one, it just asks you to identify one of the only things that you know about those fluffy white particles of water coming from the sky. And usually, even if you're in a state that you've never actually had a chance to see snow, you know this one weird fact that everybody says about snowflakes. And that's, of course, that no two, theoretically, are exactly the same. Again, if we were an in-person class, I would challenge somebody to give some proof that there's actually knowledge on that, because I don't think we've ever had the ability to verify that statement. But nonetheless, it sticks with us, and it helps us with this analogy. Because this is kind of how most developmental psychologists assume all of us are. 
We're all unique. We all have our own things that make us who we are. And there's nobody else that's almost the exact same as us. There's a catch to this, though. And what developmental psychologists argue, much like people studying snowflakes could argue, is that even though we might be unique, there are some pretty big things that are critical for us to form. So if I'm studying a snowflake, I might not know where every crystal is, but I could probably guess things like the density of the snowflake, the size of it. I could guess a lot of the, the major structures within it by knowing things like how high it was formed what type of water formed it, whether or not it was coming down fast or slow, uh, whether or not it was released at a certain altitude, whether or not there was wind in different places, uh, what the precipitation levels were in the sky as it was dropping. Okay, all of these things can tell us general information about the snowflake. And this is sort of how developmental psychologists perceive all of us again. They might not know everything that makes us tick, but understanding certain things that are happening along the way as we develop can really give developmental psychologists a better glimpse into what we might be like. Always accepting that there's going to be some individual differences that just can't be perfectly predicted. But this scientific approach to studying the unfolding process is one that's been very valuable to psychologists over the years because we now understand more than just how our cognitions are changing, but how multiple aspects of who we are are constantly shifting throughout our lifespan. So going back to what developmental psychologists today do, they actually, because of studying this unfolding process, can focus their attention on a variety of different things. Some of today's developmental psychologists do pretty much the same thing that Piaget did. They just track. They look at what's happening, and they, I don't necessarily like explain it, but they just tell people about how certain shifts on different aspects of who we are are well, shifting as we progress from infancy, or even conception, into death. Others, though, have focused their attention on the things that cause these shifts. Some have focused on biological components, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Others have focused on specific events in the environment that might play major roles. Others have talked about the interaction of these two. We'll explore this concept a little bit later because it is relatively new compared to what we've looked at. But there's one other thing that developmental psychologists look at that I want to mention before progressing. And it's those that look at the sort of atypical. The ones that look at ones who either don't experience the same things as others or don't seem to be following the same trajectory as others. What these developmental psychologists do is try to put the pieces together to get a better sense of what came about to have these things happen to specific individuals. In doing so, theoretically, have better predictive value when we see other people who've encountered similar situations or maybe just have better explanations for when certain people go on specific tracks. All of these things make developmental psychology a very broad reaching field, one that's appeared into lots of different areas that went well beyond the work of Piaget and Vygotsky that we talked about in the previous lecture. And again, this happens at the moment of conception. People, biologists, biological psychologists, and other types of psychologists looking at developmental themes have a sense of what we're going to be like from the moment we're first conceived as this tiny microscopic cell called the zygote into the point where we're born and beyond. That means they can track things like how cells split, what specific things in the body are start to form, and in terms of mind development or biological development related to psychology, we can look at how different structures and components related to the nervous system are forming while we're in the womb. And in doing so, we can have a pretty good sense of what we're capable of doing relating to the human mind, even at the moment of birth. In fact, there are specific tests that many of us are administered at birth that 
really build off of our understanding of what's happening inside the womb up to a certain point. One of the most classic tests that's administered to many newborn babies is something called the APGAR scale. It looks actually at multiple systems, not just our nervous system, and how well they're developed because of our understanding of what's happening inside of the womb. We can look at our circulatory system, our respiratory system, our muscular system, our skeletal system, and we can look, if we're talking about our nervous system, at a lot of really cool things that have developed inside the womb that we should have with us at birth that help us for survival purposes. Now, if we were in in-person class, I'd pull up a video that highlights some of the tests for these things called reflexes, stuff we've talked about in the past and our behavioral world, that many biologists and doctors and developmental psychologists know we should have and expect to see within us at birth. But it goes beyond just looking for these things for the interest of you know, checking on them. It goes into how when we do develop in the nervous system, when things go awry, there are certain reflexes that aren't there. Or if things don't develop successfully after birth, might not go away when they're supposed to or might go away when they're supposed to stay. In essence, again, because we've studied so many people and developmental psychologists have looked for things that can put us on paths or set us off paths, we know what types of things should be present, should be missing at birth, and how those things should progress in through infancy and into young childhood when it comes to reflexes and other basic skills that we do possess, like grand, wonderful hearing, pretty good taste, horrible visual abilities, and beyond. If you're ever interested in looking at this more, I do encourage you to take a developmental psych class, because unfortunately this is about all we get to cover with birth. But this is definitely something that's covered extensively in a developmental psych class because of how much is known and studied at this age. For the purposes of our class, we're going to flash forward just so we can really highlight again the different angles that developmental psychologists can take on topics. And we're going to fast forward to a rather tumultuous time for many of us, it was that period of our life called puberty. When we undergo puberty, it actually is a change, both physically and mentally, that's spurned on through small activity in the brain. I haven't talked much about different systems beyond the nervous system in this class, but if we could just take a second, we can mention this fact that there is another system very closely tied to our nervous system called the endocrine system. With this endocrine system, you have these structures called glands that release chemicals very similar, I don't know, sometimes identical, to the neurotransmitters that we've been discussing. But these chemicals are given a different name. They're called hormones because they don't necessarily get released into synapses. They simply just get released into our bloodstream so they can flow into different areas and activate a wide range of different parts of our body. And when puberty starts, the thing that really triggers it is a release of very specific hormones in a number of different glands in our brain or adjacent areas. And two particular areas where a lot of hormones are released are the hypothalamus and the pituitary glands. And these hormones that are released by these structures in the brain are sent down our body in our bloodstream to a number of different areas, but one area which is really critical are these structures called the gonads. And these gonads are the source of a lot of the hormones that then start to circulate through our body that we tend to tie to puberty. For people who have the biological sex of female, they have a relatively slow release of hormones when puberty starts. Most females start puberty at around the age of 10, 11, 12, but there are some that start puberty at around 9. And when they experience this rush or onslaught of hormones, well, it's not quite a rush. It's more gradual release of two very important hormones coursing through their system throughout most of their adult life called estrogen and testosterone. 
Many people looking at hormones don't often recognize this, but women do not only see a much greater increase in estrogen in their bodies, but they see a doubling of testosterone as well. And this change that women undergo creates a lot of very noticeable physical and, well, other social, emotional changes. We not only see changes in primary sex characteristics, but lots of secondary ones relating to voice and hair, and, uh, acne and skin changes. We also see changes in the mind, emotional changes, things that really do kind of indicate that puberty is not just one type of shift, but it's a very multifaceted shift that's spurned on by this increase in hormones. Well, why females are going through these changes, males, well, these people with the XY chromosome pairing, undergo a big shift uh, in their particular experience of puberty that starts a little bit later. And when we're calling this a big shift, we really do mean for most males, a big shift. Their start is a little bit slower, but oftentimes significantly more dramatic when they start to experience puberty at around 12, 13, some as early as 11, some as late as 15. And when they undergo this shift, it's not just a small increase in testosterone. It's usually an eight-fold increase that lasts for many, many years of their lives. And there is, for them, also an increase in estrogen or estradiol. That's to a small extent. Yeah, and something we don't usually think of when we think of males and their experience of puberty. So these changes that we undergo, that again are linked to puberty, have multifaceted impacts on us. And developmental psychologists can talk about the triggers of these things. They can talk about what's changing when it happens, and they can also talk about the, the effects of these changes after puberty's occurred. But I want to focus on this specific topic because it also really highlights something of interest for developmental psychologists that I mentioned earlier. As we discussed a couple slides ago, developmental psychologists don't just look at the typical change process that we experience. Many developmental psychologists also look at the atypical, things that don't happen <clears throat> the way we anticipate. One of the things relating to puberty that's been surprising to developmental psychologists and just people studying this topic in general is the fact that puberty has seemed to sort of creep up just a little bit year after year for many successive generations. Many researchers have tried to sort of unfold why this is taking place. They tied this to changes in diet, changes in exercise, weight changes that come with those things. They've tied it to stress. They've tied it to the introduction of chemicals within our water streams. Essentially, we've sort of realized a lot of the things that we're doing in our environment is having an impact on this natural unfolding process that occurs. And overall, it just sort of means some unusual things with most kids undergoing puberty maybe a couple months or maybe even a year earlier than they typically would have in past generations. Now, there are people who have looked at the implications of this for everybody as a whole, but there are also people who focus their attention on those that don't just experience puberty maybe a few months early, but sometimes a few years early. You know, they've looked at girls age seven and eight who start to undergo this puberty process, and boys ages eight and nine that start to undergo this puberty process. And they've tried to examine not only what sources are behind these changes, but how these things affect these kids for the majority of their lives. And what they've found is, is really uh, kind of noteworthy. Most researchers have concluded that this thing that we call precocious puberty, when children undergo puberty at a very early age, seems to have a disproportionate impact on females, those with the XX chromosome pair, in comparison to their male peers, those with the XY pair. We often see with women undergoing precocious puberty, or females undergoing precocious puberty, that they start to engage in much riskier behavior and have more academic problems as they're undergoing this process 
which could sort of be easy to identify if you do look significantly larger and older than your peers at a certain age. But not only do these things change for them then, but they persist with them throughout most of their life. What's also interesting to note is that this seems to be something that happens much more often for females than males in general. Some studies have suggested that women undergo precocious puberty about 10 times more often than their male counterparts. Why this is the case is still something we're trying to solve. But again, it loops us back to that notion that puberty is happening earlier, and there are some environmental factors that seem to be at play. Now, we're not going to, in a class like this, have the ability to unravel all the things that are tied to precocious puberty. But hopefully, this glimpse into this specific topic has piqued some interest in you and given you a sense of how we can focus on just one moment in life and look at it from so many different angles so we can better understand not only what led up to those moments, but what is going to follow those moments. That's the beauty of developmental psychology for many, that people, many people that get into the field. And to reiterate, this is what people do from the moment of conception to death in developmental psychology. They look at what happens, what led up to things, and how we can sort of map out the trajectories that people are going through in their life. Always operating on the assumption that there's individual differences. Always operating on the assumption that you know, we're not going to be able to predict everything. But hopefully through looking at enough people. We can have this sense of trajectories, things that can happen that can throw us off these trajectories, so we can have a better grasp on all of us going through our human experience and our lifespan. As I mentioned before, another big thing that many people have started to focus their attention on are things that are the triggers behind a lot of the change that we undergo throughout our lifespan. And this has opened up the door for many developmental psychologists to focus their attention on something that's more biological in nature. This concept of something called heritability. I mean, it was actually talked about really extensively if you read the bio chapter many, many weeks ago. Heritability, by definition, is the amount of a specific characteristic that we can attribute to our biological inheritance, essentially. We're really going to parse it out. It's a byproduct of our genetic makeup. And in each of us, we have roughly 20,500 genes, something we'll talk about a little bit later and we'll talk about sequencing. But let's understand that when we talk about how heritable something is, what we're asking is whether or not something you're doing or some possess, something you possess is a byproduct of high heritability, or something that we sometimes call nature, or low heritability, or something we call nurture. Early years of research on this specific topics uh, focused their attention on whether or not something was either heritable or not. We're going to talk about how this has evolved over the years, but before we do, I want us to focus on some of the early heritability research that people focused on. I guess I said focused on twice there. Anyway, I want us to look at some of the early research that was done and try to understand heritability before we were able to do some of the more interesting genetic sequencing stuff that we'll talk about a little bit later. So where do we start with well, research and heritability? Oftentimes with sibling pairs. In particular, what many researchers would do in the 40s, 50s, and 60s when we started to try to understand heritability is they'd find different types of sibling pairs. One of the things that many people sought after were these sibling pairs called identical or monozygotic twins, ones that came from the same first zygote and therefore shared the pretty much the same genetic information. And it's a few random things that we might be exposed to throughout our life that slightly microscopically shifts a few pieces of our DNA. Another pair of siblings that was highly sought after were these ones called fraternal twins, or dizygotic twins, ones that were born at pretty much the same time, but 
ones that did contain different genetic information because they were a byproduct of two fertilized cells, two zygotes, forming at the same time. These sibling pairs, which were highly sought after, were oftentimes compared on different traits to traditional siblings, or what we call fraternal, or actually now we now would call fraternal twins, ones that shared the same amount of genetic information as fraternal twins, but you know, siblings being known to share less environmental overlaps because of different eras that maybe they were around, or just different experiences because of having siblings or being exposed to different things. Another group of children started to get added into the research as things progressed were adopted siblings, ones that theoretically same, shared the same amount of genetic overlap with any other random person as they did with their siblings. These individuals, in comparison to the other types of sibling pairs, gave researchers a really interesting glimpse into the percentage of different characteristics, be it mental, or social, or physical, that we possessed. We could talk about what percentage of a specific characteristic theoretically was tied to something just by doing really powerful correlational research that started to come around in the middle of the 20th century. And this gave us a really interesting set of understanding as to where most big characteristics were theoretically being linked. It wasn't always a perfect picture. There was always debate as to whether or not things were being studied effectively and whether or not we really were missing something when we talked about the percentage of heritability for things. But it was the starting point for a lot of developmental research, and it still is something that we do to try to understand the heritability of different things that we're interested in. But another thing that started to pop up as researchers wanted to understand heritability and use siblings in special ways was research that looked at you know, the fringe topics that maybe weren't just looking at traditional change. One particular researcher that gained a lot of notoriety a couple decades ago was a gentleman named Thomas Bouchard, who, when working at the University of Minnesota, created this really unique study where he would find identical twins separated at birth, search them out, and look for things that could potentially overlap with us, things that could be linked to heritability that seemed more random. Seemed like they should just be kind of a byproduct of the things that we encounter. Bouchard published many, many overlaps between sibling pairs that he would find, identical twin pairs that he would find, really highlighting some of the unique things that he thought could be attributed to our genes in ways that we had never thought of. Just to give you a taste of Bouchard's Minnesota Twin Registry, I thought we'd look just for a second at his most famous case, his case of the two Jims, two brothers who were separated at birth, didn't know they had an identical twin, but just so happened to be named Jim by their two adoptive families. The first Jim, who's I believe pictured on the left, was named Jim Lewis. And Bouchard, like he did for all of his cases when this study started, went out to meet Jim Lewis and started asking him a number of questions about him. And these questions, as I mentioned, were really random. So he found out things like Jim Lewis had divorced a woman named Linda, had remarried a woman named Betty, was described as middle class, at least looking at his income, was described by his new wife, Betty, as romantic affectionate, had a son named James Allen, which I believe was from his first marriage, had a dog named Toy, worked at a wood shop, loved stock car racing, loved drinking Miller Lite, was a chain smoker, admittedly, and chewed his nails to the nub, which theoretically caused him to experience a decent number of migraines. Again, these seemed like random facts, but this is what Bouchard was after. Because then he would go to the other sibling and ask some similar questions about their life and what they were like. When he went to Jim Springer and asked him these questions, he found the other sibling, also was divorced from a woman named Linda, remarried a woman named Betty, was middle class, 
romantic and affectionate, had a son named James Allen, a dog named Toy, worked at a wood shop, had to love stock car racing, drank another light, was a chain smoker, chewed his nails to the nub, and often struggled with migraines. Now, this overlap was not necessarily representative of all the overlaps that Bouchard found in his studies. These were actually more abundant than most sibling pairs. But findings somewhat like this were very common in his research. He almost always found something that overlapped between these sibling pairs that seemed pretty amazing. And it led Bouchard to conclude that a lot of things like say our preference for specific types of liquor or certain people that we might be attracted to or even you know just the way we engage in things could be more inherited through our genetics than we had originally thought and it started this huge debate within the field as to how we could tease apart what's heritable through a long chain of things and what's not and eventually it started a debate over whether or not Bouchard was approaching this from a scientific perspective. Because even though these results were sensational, there were an issue with them. And it's tough to catch this issue if you don't look at it a little bit more closely. So Bouchard's whole, I guess the word shtick would make sense, on this was that he was asking these people just random questions randomly. There was no rhyme or reason to it. He just come up with a couple and look for overlaps between siblings. But when probed a little bit more, Michard admitted that the overlaps he reported certainly weren't the only questions that he was asking of the sibling pairs. In the case of the two Jims, he didn't ask him just those 20 questions. He asked them hundreds of questions. The things he reported were the things overlapped. And this win looked at a little bit closer, raised a lot of red flags for both developmental psychologists and statisticians alike. Because there was this realization almost instantly when he started talking about this, that what Bouchard was probably just doing was stumbling upon these sheer chance overlaps. Now, it's tough to really tease this out in a class like this, especially if some individuals haven't had a lot of statistics backgrounds. But one of my favorite Radio Lab episodes that is actually from a number of years ago now uh, that highlights how this works, how random overlaps occur, and also how we become obsessed with them and give them so much more meaning actually addresses this exact topic. And for those of you interested in it, and this blade of grass analogy that's discussed in it, how we kind of do get super worked up over something that is really just random, I encourage you to go to the website link that you see there. Hopefully it's still working. And really power through this 20, 30 minute video, that episode that they have. Um, it's not required, but it can explain sort of why many statisticians, when they looked closer at Bouchard's work, started to become skeptical, started to really question whether or not these amazing findings that he was producing were signaling that random things were indeed genetically kind of programmed within us. And it also was coinciding with, as we were recognizing these shortcomings, that other researchers were showing certain things that we thought were obviously inherent might not be. And this brings us back to other researchers looking at the topic of heritability from different angles. A couple years after Bouchard started his work, which they about the same time, uh, another gentleman named Gerald McClern started doing really interesting heritability studies at Penn State University. He paired up with a bunch of other individuals in Sweden that were looking at kind of aging and how the mind started to change and theoretically deteriorate as we got older. McLaren, with these individuals, tracked identical twins that seemingly had a lot of overlap in their life, but were going in very different directions when they got into older ages. He was looking at the development of things like Alzheimer's or changes in, in physical skills that happen when we get older. 
then you know what his interest in was not how these things would overlap with identical twins, but how many identical twins took very different paths when they got into their older age. And they, in these studies, started talking about sort of the unfolding process that seemed to be not just biological in nature when we get into different points in our life. They started talking about this interaction between biology and the environment that really was the key player in a lot of the different things that developed within us throughout our life. McLaren's research then expanded into looking at other types of sibling pairs and how they could tease apart the general heritability of specific things, but also the kind of key moments in life where there were interactions between the environment and biology that could turn on specific genes or turn off specific genes and put us down a variety of different paths in life. McLaren's research started a very robust conversation that's still going on today in a lot of developmental labs. And he certainly wasn't the only one doing this at the time. It's just he's the one that got a lot of notoriety for some of the things that he did. McLaren's passed relatively recently, but a lot of his lineage still goes on looking at these topics in, in pretty amazing ways. And it's broadened the scope of developmental psychology in, in places that make many of today's developmental psychologists at Berkeley or other places really kind of adept at picking up on a lot of things that make developmental psychology something that, that bleeds into a lot of branches of psychology. And it also, as I've mentioned, has led a lot of people down the path if they're in developmental psychology really need to understand some of the biological components that we talked about earlier. Your book mentioned this, but just for those of you that need a refresh on this since it's been a number of weeks, when we study things like heritability, and we're drilling really is studying biological inheritance that comes from our 23 pairs of chromosomes that we contain in the vast majority of our cells. And within those 23 pairs of chromosomes in particular, we're looking at these things called genes, the roughly 20,500 of them that each of us possesses. We've been able to, for those of you wondering, successfully sequence a gene, what we call a genome, for many individuals. It's something that we sought after for many years, expecting that to be sort of the holy grail of heritability research, where once we were able to do it, we could know the exact code of what caused somebody to behave the way they did. But and then now what we know when it comes to research on genomes is that when we look at your genes, at, at your body, you know, this particular code is not kind of the end product, but kind of a, an interface with the environment around us that's constantly updating and, and, and changing and tweaking not the genes themselves, but the way they manifest themselves and the way they, they impact our body. So that just sequencing genes, knowing who we are, is, is just part of the story. But a critical one that well, many developmental psychologists, they want to understand the sources of things, which not all do. Again, there's lots of different types of developmental psychologists out there, but those that want to understand these things do need to really have a good understanding of biology and all the different things that come within each of our cells, well, most of our cells, within our body. And this is, I think, a really good place to end. Uh, this is a slightly shorter lecture because we don't get to watch some of the fun little videos that I usually include in this one, but hopefully from it, even though we didn't get to see some babies displaying reflexes or a couple talks by some of the famous researchers we mentioned, you've developed a pretty good sense of what developmental psychology is all about. And if we're at that point, well, then we can transition to another branch of psychology, one that does focus on well, the environment and how it shifts us in different ways. That's what we'll be doing in our next class when we start to talk about social psychology. But for today, I hope you got a lot out of this. I hope you're still hanging in there. And I wish you all the best. And I also hope to see you soon. Take care.